The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to this morning's message of how to increase your anointing. So I strongly suggest if you're watching my video, you take notes because Jennifer told me I couldn't possibly cover this much material in one message. So I could talk real fast or you could take notes real fast, one or the other or both. But uh, Lord, just bless this message that we would accomplish the purpose for which a message goes forth that it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. And I believe that you've revealed in me uh, your truth, and that truth needs to be decreed and declared. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So it's how to increase the anointing. There's uh, uh, really four elements that I've seen over the years for understanding revelation, understanding revelation meaning his reality revealed to us through his word and his personhood. And he is the word and the word was made flesh and he dwells among us. I've always learned from the, from the very onset in my intimacy with God was I learned that he was a person, not an it. So when I refer to the Holy Spirit is a person and he deserves the honor and respect that a person is due compared to a thing. Now, uh, your spiritual authority or your influence under God uh, is according to a measure. And I want to begin with Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians 3, verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ever ask or think, according to the measure of the power that works in us, according to the Measure. Well, what measure? How much do you have? Well, however much you have, it says that God is going to give you abundantly according to the measure of the power that works in us. And so to me, there's a mandate to increase that anointing. There's a mandate to say, I want to increase that measure. Uh, and it's by reason of use, as we know. Uh, so there's, there's four, four elements. One, your, your level of revelation is proportional to your spiritual authority. And I, I want to, uh, I'll give you the second and the third and the fourth, and we may not cover them. <laughs> the second one is that your measure of influence with God or your, uh, the measure of your uh, anointing will be based on your gifts and callings. Uh, Thirdly, your measure of anointing is based on your ability to hear. And fourth, your anointing is based on understanding both jurisdiction and the heart that expands. There's a limitation and then there's an unlimited. And knowing the difference, okay, uh, would be very helpful. So anyway, I want to start with this because this is the first... Uh, thing that the Lord showed me, um, that walking in the anointing or your spiritual authority, you are not a caped superhero. I thought I was. When I got saved and God said, I've anointed you to preach the gospel, I thought, see, when I was a kid, I always tied a bath towel around my neck and jumped off furniture and imitated any and every superhero that I've ever seen on television or in a comic book. So when he says you have an anointing and you have spiritual authority, I pictured the superhero. And boy, did I get rebuked quick. God took me to the book of Judges, and he literally, I felt my head go down like this. He had me go down to a footnote. And the footnote was in reference to a scripture in Judges that said, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. So naturally, I pictured my cape, my super. Oh, and the anointing has come upon me, uh, like a swashbuckler or, or you know, some, any superhero with a cape 
would have done. And God had me, it actually felt like somebody put their head on and made me look down to the footnote. And the footnote says, a better translation would be that the Holy Spirit put on Gideon. And I saw that. And I went, oh, where to, where to be the cape or the glove? <laughs> it's God who is at work in me to will and to perform. It's not me using the anointing. God says, no, I want to use you. I want to work through you. My anointing goes to you and through you. Isn't that a little different picture than the swashbuckler operating in the anointing with the cape, like a cape crusader, like he's in charge? <laughs> When in reality, it was the humble and the meek and the quiet spirit where God said, I'm going to clothe you. As a matter of fact, we've coined that term drop down, which is really going to the secret place, right? We have a booklet coming out shortly on discovering the secret place. Drop down, we got that from uh, uh, the uh, Greek lexicon, uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, where in our Bible, every place where your Bible says put on, you know, I'm going to put on the cloak. It wasn't the swashbuckler cape. Put on in our Bible is the Greek word enduo, which means to sink into in order to be clothed. Like Kind of like baptism in water, right? You sink into in order to be covered. You go down before it goes up. And so enduo, put on. Look, put on the Lord Jesus. Put on bowels of mercy. Put on... The new man, put on, put on, put on, put on, is to sink into in order to be clothed. And it makes a lot of scriptures come to light and make even more sense, like, uh, let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and your mind. But where is it coming from? It's coming from your Bible heart. It's coming from putting on bowels of mercy, the gut, the belly. Out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. Take heed to your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. And what do these issues of life do? They spring up like a fountain, John chapter 4, right? They spring, so it's down going up. So if you want it to go up, we even had a third grader in, in the, when we did children's church teaching this with Bucket Man. You know, there's a crank. You ever seen an old-fashioned bucket on a crank, on a rope? And it says, you lower the bucket. And one kid raises his hand, you Everybody knows you've got to go to Jesus within because there's no living water in your head. Third grade, adults, pay attention. You could learn something out of the mouths of babes, huh? Hmm? Now, uh, <clears throat> if, if God was going to begin to uh, teach us uh, how to come under greater influence of God, and that's really what it is, coming under the influence. In the world, you hear, they're under the influence of drugs, they're under the influence of alcohol, they're under the influence of a malevolent spirit, they need deliverance, all right? Under the influence. Who's ruling, in other words? That's the real key. And uh, uh, Ephesians 3.20 says that God wants to give us exceedingly abundantly above all that we would even ask or think, Before, above what we would ask or think, according to the measure of the power that works in us. Wow. You know, uh, Colossians 1.11 talks about being strengthened according to his glorious power. And the challenge for me was always, it says, and being st steadfast and patient with joy. That's supernatural. You can't, you can't flesh that one. Steadfast and patient with joy. Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. <laughs> you know, that's all of life, folks. Uh, <laughs> steadfast and patient with joy? I'll tell you, that's a supernatural walk, and you need a measure of anointing to increase to even accommodate that. Now, I believe it's a progressive reality. Scripture shows us uh, just as we've taught recently on the journey of the bride in the Song of Solomon. It is a journey. And it's a progression of maturity. God wants to make us grown up and mature. He rebuked them in Hebrew, said, by reason of time, you ought to be teachers. You had an anointing that you didn't develop. You didn't increase that anointing. By reason of time, you should have been teachers, and now you still need milk. We don't want that kind of a rebuke for any of us, right? Full stature, our whole basic 
concept from the time that I got saved was full stature was the mission is to disciple and to put a fire under people uh, like we've gotten emails in the past. Here's somebody telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. All right. What's the, the, the church is great on what to do, not necessarily how to do. And I think what uh, Jennifer and I did was uh, pursued God to say, give us the how to's because there's plenty of people that are willing to do the will of God, but really don't know how to apply it. And, uh, we have knowledge. We need wisdom of application. We need, we need to be able to do this. So uh, looking first at that first segment of spiritual authority and learning to become under the influence of God, under the influence of God, not the world of flesh or the devil. Uh, they're doing their best to influence us. They're doing the best to influence our children. Culture wants to brainwash our children. And some of the keys... Uh, your parents do with young children particularly, you need to start right off the bat teaching them what the Bible says rather than what they're hearing culturally because there will be a conflict. Uh, they've hijacked words that need to be reinterpreted. Uh, they don't make a distinction. Love is love covers everything, including lust and sin. You know, It ignores holiness and truth. Truth isn't Jesus anymore. It's not, it's truth is you have your truth, I have my truth, they have their truth, we all have truth, da, 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 da. And these are the kinds of things that are going to change. But we're going to increase the anointing because as darkness gets darker, anointing should be increasing proportionally so that we shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and a per perverse generation. So we're not saying it's not a crooked and a perverse generation. What we're saying is, are we shining? Is the anointing in us declaring the glory of God regardless of the darkness. Because you can shout at the darkness all you want. The, the, the message of the gospel, though, is that you would grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. My railroad scripture from the time I was a baby Christian is still as powerful today as it was then, that I might know him in the Amplified Philippians 3.10, that I might progressively, hear that word? Not progressive Christianity. That I might progressively know him and all the wonders of his person. And we're going to cover some of that. But uh, first of all, uh, understanding that when it comes to spiritual authority and the, the getting under the influence of that anointing of God and increasing that anointing, we need to understand that revelation came for the purpose of illumination. When you're reading your Bible, there's people that think that they don't hear from God. You hear from God, you're just not paying close enough attention that when you're reading something and it kind of stands out, even marginally stands out, Honor God by embracing it. I used to use the word cherish it when I was training Jennifer on, on how to uh, pray read. And it, it, some of it's subjective, so it's kind of hard to find a language sometimes. But cherish didn't really translate. But for her, she said, oh, what you're saying is absorb. Mm, yeah, that's right. So you want that word that has a little bit of life that somehow seemed to jump out of your daily reading of scripture, one little phrase, maybe one little word, that's God speaking to you. Don't minimize that ever. You want to increase in your anointing, you got to pay attention to that because revelation, here's your notes for the note takers, revelation for illumination. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens, <laughs> I'm not going to cover all these notes, um, <laughs> but I'm going to have fun trying. Uh, the second part is, you know, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edge. It divides asunder. I love that word, uh, merosmos in the Greek. It's divide asunder. It separates. Now, why does it separate? Why does the Word of God, if you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden something leaps out at you, what it does is it says, this is me. And everything else is flesh or the world or the devil. This is me. It separates. What purpose does it separate for? It separates to clarify. This is God. This isn't. This is flesh. This is spirit. Right? Don't you want to, you need to know the difference. So revelation comes and it illuminates you. Some people, when they first get a word that comes off the page to them or means something special and they can't put their finger on it, they say they've got clarity. When my dad got saved, that was his first thing. He says, ah. For peace, he said, I feel like I've received my composure. 
I've got clarity. Clarity and composure is actually a good explanation of a subjective experience of having a revelation from God, whether it's for salvation or sanctification. That revelation is for illumination. Separation is for the purpose of clarification. What, why, what do we do in the clarification? You make a choice. <laughs> you can choose to receive it or you can choose to reject it. But trust me, if you want to grow in the anointing, you start rejecting it little by little, you will get conditioned to not hear it. So you don't want to. When God clarifies that this is spirit, this is flesh, choose, choose life, okay? <laughs> the third element in understanding that measure of revelation is unification for the purpose of cooperation. So God separated it out and said, this is spirit, this is flesh. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword. It divides, it separates. It separates for clarification, but then ultimately when you choose life, He puts it back together again for cooperation. And now that's God working through you to will and to do according to His good pleasure. It's worth it to obey, isn't it? So you have that revelation is for illumination, separation is for clarification, and unification is for cooperation. He's not trying to annihilate your mind, will, and emotions. He's trying to get that soulish nature under subdued, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> we were born again not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So when you got born again, you were born again of incorruptible seed. But let's pay attention to this one word here, seed. The seed really hides the full glory of what God wants to express through that seed. So you may be born again yesterday, and there is in seed form a destiny in there an expression that is unique. You're a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. And that expression is still lying dormant. For me, that was enough to know that I wanted to pursue him, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. I wanted to discover everything because I knew inside of me there was a seed, an incorruptible seed, but I wanted it to grow and express itself through me. It's God's personality through you. It's not about your personality. People are writing off a lot of sinful behavior and calling it, well, that's the way I am. Well, yeah, but that's carnality. You need to change. <laughs> you, know, don't need to, you don't need to polish it. <laughs> you, know, you, need to, you need to kill it. <laughs> right? So the seed uh, kind of hides that, that glory of the expression of what God wants to be. And, and the goal is he wants to fully express himself through a uniqueness. There never will be another you. There never was another you. So that uniqueness needs to be expressed through him. Please, let them do it. You'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> You'll find life abundant. Well, I'm surprised by life in the midst of a dark and a perverse generation. Now, he wants you to walk, as it says in Colossians, uh, Paul's prayer for the Colossians, was that you would walk worthy of the Lord. Uh, increasing in the knowledge of God, that you would walk in the full weight of the Lord, worthy of the Lord, in the full weight. Walk in that anointing. Did you ever hear about the kabod being the weight? And in the Greek it's doxa, but uh, D-O-X-A, but it's still an expression of his power that's moving to us and through us. Now, uh, I often saw that, okay, I was born again with this seed, but if you understand the seed in principle, the seed doesn't really grow until it dies. It dies and the shell is broken and the taproot goes down. So there has to be not a destruction or an annihilation of the flesh, but a death to the flesh so that it becomes usable. Remember we said for the purpose of cooperation. 
rather than an independent uh, struggle of the flesh. So the full weight or the nature of the action, God wants to express himself through. And uh, we, we've, we've taught over and over again on uh, a progressive revelation, a progressive maturity, but there's also crises experiences that can be very, very beneficial. When people finally realize that what they've been doing isn't working real well. And uh, we see that John addressed these uh, elements, and this is the easiest way to teach it, is he says, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. I speak to you young men because the word of God abides in you strong and you've overcome the wicked one. Can you tell the difference? The child is still basically, thank God, he forgave me for my sin because I was a mess. Boy, I needed me, 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 me. And that's still good because you need to know that he loves me, 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 me. But at some point, you know, like we see a baby burp or something, we think, oh, I'm that cute. But if a teenager does it, it's not so cute, right? All right. So we need to see this progress. So I speak to you, little children, because you're... Your sins are forgiven. You know the forgiver. You know that you're clean. You know that you're a new creation. But I speak to you, young men, because the word of God abides in you strong. You overcome the wicked one. In other words, I speak to you, young men and women, because you've overcome the wicked one. You're walking in victory. Big difference than just being forgiven. You're walking in victory. And I speak to you, fathers, because you've known him who was from the beginning. And a father in maturity rather than showing you what I can do, you know, the superhero. And don't let the gray hair fool you either, because there's plenty of gray-haired people that are still children and young men <laughs> in their heart. God's talking to three class of, John was talking about three classifications of maturity, not chronological age. I speak to you children, I could have been a 60-year-old person that just got saved the day before. I speak to you young men. So the child is kind of like an imprint. That's the seed. The young man is like somewhat of a representation. I can remember uh, my cousin uh, and was estranged from his father, but I knew his father, and I knew that he was a Golden Gloves champion boxer, and he had a bounce to his step, and he had a mannerisms. Uh, and uh, my cousin wasn't raised with him, but I watched him as he grew. He had the same manifestation. He had the same mannerisms. So he went from, from being just an imprint or a seed to some kind of a representation. I mean, I could actually see. You know, I know you, you women can do this with babies. Oh, look, he looks like Uncle Joe. Well, if Uncle Joe is bald and toothless, then I could agree with you. But other than that, I don't, I don't get those kind of resemblance when they're that little. All right? Some people just have a gift for that. I can see them a little, when they get a little older, and then you watch how they behave, and you look at their appearance, and you say, oh, I can see they're a representative. But ultimately, what God wants to do in us is a full manifestation of our uniqueness. He wants mature mothers and fathers, but he wants that full expression. And that, that full manifestation is that unique, one-of-a-kind, never was another you, but, but you're mature. Mature is full stature. Perfect in the Bible doesn't mean flawless. It means mature, complete, operating the way it was intended, functioning the way it was intended. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's what I want to do. If we're going to increase the anointing, I want to start right at this level um, in, in the first area of increasing your spiritual influence. And Increasing your spiritual influence, meaning how do I increase getting under his influence? And here, here's what I did as a young Christian. I studied the names of God, and you know, you can go to Bible school and study the names of God. But I wanted to pray read the names of God. I wanted to have God reveal himself to me with that characteristic, that attribute. And I wanted it written on the tablet of my heart. And God insisted that if he was taking me to the school of the Spirit, that it, he was going to give me a revelation. He was going to show me how to cultivate that revelation, not just know it. And how to check myself to see if there was fruit as a result. 
No, no wiggle room there, is there? I give you a revelation. I'm going to teach you how to develop it. And then I'm going to have you critique yourself to see if there's any fruit. You know, if you did it right, there would be fruit. So I said, okay. And one in particular out of all the names of God, Elohim, the creator God, and, and El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. And you can learn all the other attributes and characteristics of our Jesus uh, through Old Testament names because the name matches the nature and the function. Now, here's what I noticed, particularly Jehovah, that the actual name meant the revealing one. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I wanted revelation, but I wanted revelation of him, that I might know him, that I might know the wonders of his personhood. Okay? So he says, fine, but you're going to take these names and you're going to go one at a time, and I'm going to give you a revelation of them, then I'm going to show you how to cultivate it, and then you're going to look and see if you're showing up in your life. Oh, man. I don't know. I think it would have been easier to go to Bible school and pick and choose what I wanted. He didn't let me. He said, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit. But I think I would have had teachers that would have been a little more lenient with me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But anyway. So Jehovah means the revealing one. Wherever this is used, he's revealing some character attribute. Exodus 3.15. Uh, you will often see in the scripture, he says, I am. Mm -hmm. I am. And if you don't know what I am you need, he, I am that I am, that I am, I am. So you're, you're without an excuse. <laughs> Whatever you need, he is. All right. So I looked and I saw that Jehovah, uh, the characteristic, the attribute, is that he's the revealing one. And there's no variableness. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, that he's holiness. So you can't separate love from holiness because Jehovah is, is the God of holiness versus sinfulness. So we can't let the culture hijack that word love and just mean love. Oh, those two people committing adultery, they love each other. They deserve to love each other. You know, No, that's called lust. Uh, love has to be both holy and God is the author of the definition of love, not man. Right? God is love. I am love, all right? He's the only one that I think deserves to give a definition of what it is. So, he goes, I am Jehovah Nisi. And I want to pray this right now because we need this uh, in the midst of our congregation. He's not only your victory banner because we're going to move from victory to victory. We're going to move from an increased anointing. So wherever you're at, you're going to go higher, forward and upward, all right? But it's also interpreted as the miracle worker. I'll tell you what, we've got friends and family that need miracles, and I know you know people that do too. So, Father, right now we release that miracle-working power, that miracle-working power that, that raises people up and does the impossible in the realm of physical healing and the realm of, of circumstances. All of a sudden I see, uh, matter of fact, I'm seeing people that have been struggling with a move, and it's, it's going to start, God's going to start making a way where there was not a way. And I'm seeing people who the doctors have told them is hopeless, and and it doesn't, it, there's no reversal. And God's saying, I'm the God of reversal. I'm the God that I can change. I can change the weather. I can change uh, every molecule in your physical body. And I can change your DNA. And so, Father, I just believe that right now there's miracle working power flowing in our healing. There's also a, 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 a healthy resistance to the onslaught of, of, of malevolent forces of spirits of infirmity in Jesus' name. And we thank you that we are clothed. How do we get clothed in it? We drop down, we sink into that secret place, and from that secret place we draw upon health and healing that flows in us, to us, and through us. Jehovah Nisi, let it be written on the tablet of our heart. He's our victory banner. He is our miracle worker. All right. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. If you, if you feel like you, uh, you've been uh, uh, faithful and God is not providing, then perhaps you need to know him as a person more than provision. You need to know him as the provider. You may be looking to your own resources. People that, are, that have strengths and giftings can often trade and lean more heavily on their strength and their gifting than on God as the author and the, 
the provider. So, Father, we look at that. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. I want to tell you something. Uh, this, this was the, 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 the revelation that changed my life. Uh, peace is militant. Peace is not passive. Peace is not for wimpy Christians. Peace is the, the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. It's militant. And as a matter of fact, that's the way he appeared to Gideon. And he said, you will strike the enemy as one corporate man. You will strike the enemy. But in his revelation or how he appeared to Gideon before the battle was that God of Shalom. He was the Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. So the God of peace prepared him for war. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind better than any of your manipulations, your, your concepts, your things that you think. This will keep me safe. And you know, the sad part is to this day, by discerning of spirits, even mature Christians protect themselves when they are in an adverse situation or they're around people they're not comfortable with. Down here in the gut, they put up a wall. That's carnality, pure carnality. What you just did was you cut off the protection from God and decided to protect yourself. The only legitimate wall for a spirit-filled Christian is peace. You put up any man-made wall, and I'll tell you what, you are guarding your heart and your mind, not God. And guess what? Uh, we use this example. Uh, uh, say, say you're walking in a grocery store, and you see the boss that fired you. <laughs> this is a good test. The boss that didn't like you or fired you or whatever. Everybody's got somebody like this. Don't you have a Moriarty? Sherlock, huh? Doesn't Sherlock Holmes have a counterpart? Well, sometimes you have a certain kind of counterpart in your life, and they'll pop up. Uh, until Jennifer got uh, some ministry from me when we first got married, she was a school psychologist, and she traveled to different schools. Every school, what a coincidence, just happened to have this one kind of teacher. And she was like, oh, no, here it goes again. There's this one teacher. And teachers sometimes argue with the school psychologist because they, they, they want to force a child out of their class because they're disruptive. And, it's, and sometimes it doesn't really, it's more their irritation than it is a legitimate concern. And so they kind of clash, all right? But Jennifer got ministry on this, and guess what happened? We prayed through that one person and got her to release forgiveness, received peace, and when peace guarded her heart and her mind, she went back to work, and that lady was different. The lady was different. I don't think so. <laughs> I think Jennifer's wall brought it on. Huh? Abused children bring on abuse because they've got, they've got that, that hurt and that wound that's like an open door saying, kick me. And you know what? People will comply in their flesh. People are like that in the flesh. All right? So the only legitimate wall is the peace that surpasses understanding will guard your heart and your mind. And here's the beautiful thing about discernment, in which all of you have the capacity to discern at this level. You know, I could take an unsaved person and say, do you know when you're stressed and when you're relaxed? Let me hear you. Well, then don't give me any Christian excuses on why you can't discern what's going on in you. If I can discern the tip of the iceberg of what's going on in another Christian, how much more are you responsible to know what's going on? The other nine-tenths. I'm maybe feeling the tip of the iceberg. But I can tell when somebody's got a wall. That's not hard. As a matter of fact, so can you. You've probably not paid any attention to it. But have you ever had somebody walk up to you and talk and you felt like walking backwards while they were talking? <laughs> Where'd that push come from? came from willpower. Willpower can be to the point of manipulation witchcraft. There's a push behind it. Letting your yes be yes and your no be no, anything else is of the wicked one. I don't know where this fits in with the message, but you needed to hear it. <laughs> now, so we're learning that the revealing one is Jehovah. So to move with the spiritual authority and increase your anointing, I suggest you take all of the Jehovah messages. Get a list of them. Jehovah Shema, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, the Lord our shepherd, the Lord who is there, present. Oh, people that suffer with loneliness. You need a revelation of Jehovah Shema. 
Loneliness is an impossibility. Loneliness is a spirit. Loneliness is not a feeling. Loneliness is a spirit. Because God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You're the one that is being distracted. And a lot of times there's demonic activity attached to it. It's not just you being distracted. So, Jehovah Malkadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Uh, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Isn't that interesting? He didn't use Jehovah, the commander of chief of the armies of God, will crush Satan beneath your feet. He put Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, will crush the enemy beneath your feet. When the peace of God rules, who's ruling? Everybody should know that one. Let the peace of God rule. That's Jesus is ruling in your life when you have peace. When you don't have peace, Jesus isn't ruling right now. You may be saved, but he's not ruling. It should be a signal that you need to get back there. He didn't go anywhere. You need to get back there, and peace will crush the enemy. As a matter of fact, what I learned was that when I'm at peace, if someone was totally demonic, it's like a semi-permeable membrane. I would, and this is a good Bible term, I would bear witness, feel. You can feel atmospheres, environments, good or bad. I feel it, but it don't go in. Most Christians, if they're not careful, when they feel it bad, they own it. Then you got to get rid of it. I used to watch intercessors. There'd be a demonic manifestation in their prayer meeting, and they'd want to run. No, you don't run away. <laughs> Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. By run away, I mean what I mean is that they're uncomfortable, so they want to avoid the discomfort rather than realize that discomfort is manifesting for a redemptive solution. Pray, if nothing else. Release loving intercession. Out of my belly flows loving intercession flowing in behalf of them. The early church in the Didache, the outline, before they had a New Testament, and they could only teach Old Testament and the things that Jesus actually told the apostles. They told them to fast and pray for your enemies. <laughs> How would you like to be a baby Christian, run against some people that are hostile, maybe even in your own family, and then you fast and pray for them? You know what it'll do? It'll change your heart, and you'll see that they're the victim, not you. I get weary of people that need ministry on rejection in the church. How long are you going to be saved before you realize that you should be allowing, uh, you know, they're, they're praying for them and releasing forgiveness to them and releasing demands and expectations to them changes you. And then you see they're the needy one, not you. You're not the one who's, oh, poor me, I'm being hurt, my feelings are hurt. No, they need to die. They don't need hurt. <laughs> we need to kill them. All right, no, all right. We won't go there. All right. So do you understand? To increase your anointing, the, the first thing for spiritual authority or getting under the influence of God would be that there's a progressive revelation of the revealing one. Learn to walk with Jesus and those various attributes. Everything that Jehovah is a revelation of some aspect or characteristic of Jesus, along with the other names of God. But I just like Jehovah mainly because it said the revealing one. Oh, that's what I wanted. I wanted revelation. I wanted him to reveal himself, not just knowledge. I wanted to reveal him, a knowledge of him, intimate knowledge of him. All right. The second area <clears throat> um, would be according to your spiritual influence will be proportional to your gift and calling. Now, the most, the most obvious thing we know about gifts and calling is we know that uh, not everybody is called a prophet, but everyone can prophesy. So there is a limitation on your gift and calling. And right now we have Facebook, which allows everybody to be an apostle. Everybody can be a prophet. I'm joking. All right. It's a failure to understand jurisdiction. Armchair experts have always <laughs> been an interesting breed in the church. Um, I can remember a guy who we would, we would have, uh, uh, there'd be tongues and interpretation 
when there was a, a lull in the worship. And this naysayer said, that ain't God. You know why? I can tell you when it's going to happen. Right when there's a quiet period, that's when it's going to happen. So that can't be God. Oh, you want God to interrupt the preacher? You want him to interrupt? <laughs> Isn't this silly? Armchair experts. They're everywhere. But now they have platforms. So you want to increase it with your influence of God, at least know your gift and your calling. Hmm? And grow in it, yes, but understand it and respect that not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a prophet, not everybody's a pastor, not everybody's an evangelist, and not everybody's a teacher. But they are called to do what? To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So you got to respect somebody somewhere, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> I know people go, I put my pants on the same way that they do, one leg at a time. You know, that kind of attitude really, you, you've minimized even your credibility and your anointing. Remember, remember uh, Prophet Denny, when he had that young man, that's still my favorite story. I've told this a million times. People have been with me for years. Oh, that's that story again. But this young man followed him around going, I want to increase my anointing. I want to increase my anointing. I want to... And he didn't, wasn't answering him. And he was teaching classes on prophecy and <clears throat> activating people in the prophetic. And he went, but, but, but you don't understand. I want to increase my anointing like yours. He goes, you want to increase your anointing? Go get a job. Get married. Have kids. Your anointing will increase. Nothing, nothing 10 years of life can't fix, all right? In other words, he was manifesting a whole lot of flesh even though he had a sincere desire for more. All right. Isn't that true? Any of you people learn that? Get married, have kids. And s suddenly if there was some selfishness, some selfishness there, it started to get dealt with <laughs> almost automatically. Now, uh, the gifts are, are, are broken down into three major categories. Uh, we've called them, and the church has called them, the gifts of the Father, the gifts of the Spirit, and the gifts of the Son. Now, uh, the Father's gifts uh, are what we would call, too, and they've been taught as the motivational gifts, prophesying, serving, teaching, love. You can find this. I'm not going to cover this in the detail. You can go into Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, and those are gifts of the Father. Those are love gifts, and guess what? People used to say, what's my gift, Pastor? What's my gift? And they never did anything. So I'd say, start loving these people and let me watch you, and let me see how you love, and I'll tell you what your gift is. At least I can pick out the motivational gift. You know, you've heard the illustration where uh, the preacher knocked over the glass, and the server ran, and swept it up. The exhorter said, don't worry about it. Next time, put the glass on the left side. Well, that could be the teacher too. You know, but they were all loving in their own way. But they were loving according to a motivation of how they love. So we learn the motivational gifts. And you should learn that that's a gift from the Father. You all have it. There's no limitation there. You need to find out how, how does mine manifest? And help me understand the ones who don't manifest my way. The second ones, of course, are the manifestations of the Spirit. And they're given to profit all. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, etc. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 11. Those are the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> and then uh, the gifts of the Son, Ephesians 4, 10 through 16. He who descended also is the one who ascended far above all heavens, and he gave that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some, this is for all of the armchair experts, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some pastors and teachers. All right? Right there, there's a limitation. That's one of the few limitations, though, that has to do with calling. Now, <clears throat> here's the third element to increase your anointing. And this is probably the one I should have spent the most time on. Uh, and that is your revelation, your level of insight will be directly proportional to your ability to hear. 
And that's very clear in Scripture. Mark chapter 4. And when he talked about sowing and reaping, Jesus even said, if you don't understand this one, how will you understand anything? Because it was the law of reciprocity or the law of sowing and reaping. If you don't understand sowing and reaping, you're not going to understand much of anything in the Bible. That is like the overarching principle of everything. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. What you sow, you reap. If you don't understand sowing and reaping. So he went on to uh, say, uh, take heed what you hear because the same measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That's, there's kind of a, 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 you can call this two different things. I've, over the years, I've called it either the law of responding to what you hear or the law of even conditioning of the heart. Um, if you're open to the degree that you're open, you receive. You can't receive something you're not open to, and therefore you really can't give somebody something that you've never received. We have a lot of that, though. It's called opinions. <laughs> Opinions may not be revelatory. You can't give anything you haven't received, and you can't receive something you're not open to. So really the law of responding is to what degree are you open to what you hear, and how do you hear? If anyone wills to do his will, he will know. Oh, you have to be willing to be willing first, correct? Willing to be willing. As a matter of fact, this is a word of encouragement for many people who say, I hope I didn't miss the will of God. I hope I didn't, oh, I hope I don't miss the will of God. Actually, that is so refreshing to hear someone even say that. <laughs> there are so many people who could care less about pursuing passionately the will of God. So if you even say, I, should, oh, I don't want to miss the will of God, that's actually, a, you're actually fulfilling John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do his will, he will know. God will reveal himself to a willing heart an open heart. And that's the whole key to Mark chapter 4. He who has, it will be measured to you. What, what scripture did we open up to? It's going to be measured to you. The very scripture we started this with increasing the anointing was Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the measure of the power of God that works in us measure of the power of God that works in us. It tells me it can be different for different people. It tells me that you can have a lot of religion and maybe not a lot of reality. But the power that works in you is where the life of influence really comes. That's true spiritual authority. So the law of listening with an open heart, more will be given. That would be the simplest way to say it. Listening with an open heart, more will be given. Um, <clears throat> he who has ears, let him hear. Fifteen times that appears in the New Testament. Jesus probably stated this because oftentimes 80% of our life is spent in talking, <laughs> which was my first reprimand in the school of the Spirit. I always say first. There was a lot of them. There was a lot of first. But he told me, Dennis, when you, I was a talker, he says, uh, you're quoting scripture and you're talking away. He says, um, when you were in school, did you do all the talking in class? Mm. You really want an answer, God? I think you're, you're asking me questions you already know the answers to. I was that kid that when they said, okay, we're going to have a minute of silence. I can't do it. <laughs> you know. All right. But first thing he taught me was, you're going to learn to shut up. I'm going to give you the tongue, Dennis, of a disciple. And you're going to hear a word in season so that you can give it to them that are weary. But morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear, but hearing has to be learned. It has to be learned. The visually impaired know this, don't they? You never notice the person vision. They had to develop their hearing in the natural. Their life depended on it. How much more, if you're his sheep and his sheep hear his voice, 
your life depends on hearing from God too. So I don't buy into this. Well, I don't hear from God. You do. You're probably not listening. You've been conditioned to either expect euphoria or shouts, trumpet blasts, when it's really the still small voice. And it can be even as mild as feeling like there's a little bit of life on that scripture. Somebody said something and it kind of stuck. Zoe life can be just a mild bearing of witness, but you have to get quiet or you won't hear it. You have to wean your flesh like a weaned child with its mother. You need to say like David, I've quieted my soul within me like a weaned child with its mother. Until you quiet that noisy mind, will, and emotions that's all, all over the map, uh, you're not going to hear. Hearing has to be vital. Um, I, I've seen people in my first pastorate that were delivered from some serious situations when I gave them a simple tool. Some of them were under psychiatric care and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, and I gave one tool, and the psychiatrist and the psychologist says, just keep doing what your pastor said. I said, you give power to what you give attention to. You give it the power. Whatever you give attention to, it's either going to be Jesus or it's going to be something else. But you make that choice. You give power to what you give attention to, and you give power to what you think is important. So you want to grow in the anointing of God, you're going to have to look at the Word of God as far more important, vital. If you don't see it as that way, you'll be like the, the seed that fell on the, on the gravel, sprang up, but withered as soon as persecution or hard times or trouble came. got hurt by church people. So you don't go to church not because you got hurt by church people. But hearing, well, uh, you can not only receive what you say is important, the opposite works. You you're become insensitive to anything you don't feel as important. The easiest way to do you even have a, what do they call that, Jennifer? S, uh, reticular activating system, RAS. Reticular, an unsaved person can do this. How much more should we be able to do it? And that is, I want to go fishing in the morning. I want to play golf in the morning. You will not need an alarm clock. You told yourself it's important, and guess what? You'll get up. Even if normally during the week you can't, you need the alarm clock, if you said it's important. Mothers that are worried that they're heavy sleepers and they got a newborn and they want to hear that little baby whimper, if you say that's important, you'll hear it. I don't care how heavy of a sleeper, you'll hear it. You give power to what you say is important, but you also, by the same token, if you dismiss something as unimportant your hearing will be horrible in that area. Your perception of life in general is based on those two principles. What you say is important and what you say isn't. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. That's what Jesus is saying. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. It may not, but let him. Choose life. <laughs> and what we've called the law of response, not only must it be learned, not only must it be vital, but it requires a response. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. This is the person that's blessed. You can't just give a lot of lip service to these things. Matthew 13, 12, whoever has to him more will be given and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. This could be called the law of response. The more you respond to what you hear and understand or see, the more you receive. The reverse is true. The more you fail to respond to what you hear, eventually you will lose what you had. You can call that hardness of heart or insensitivity, but it's caused by a lack of responding to the truth. And this causes you to take for granted even the good things that God has done. And you'll say, I'm not hearing from God. Don't blame him. He's done... 
I'll give you the word he gave me. You give it to you too because he gives it to me. He gives it to you. He said, my thoughts, Dennis, are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of sands on the sea. And you haven't heard one grain? I don't think that's on his side. I think there's a lack of response on your side of properly silencing that noisy flesh and getting into the place of receiving what he has for you. And how, how do you do this? this is when I, even when I taught Jennifer, I says, too, when we start walking in Revelation, you start getting these, these things that are so mild. But honor them. Cherish them. Magnify the Lord. I like Mary's prayer, right? My soul does magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoices in Christ my Savior. So your spirit, to allow that rejoice, you've got to allow your soul to magnify it. And what I taught Jennifer to do, and I says, this, this might sound just kind of mechanical, but say it out loud to somebody. If something exciting came forth from the script, say it. Verbalize it. You give power to what you give attention to. Write it down. We've journaled ever since I've been saved, 40-some years. I still... By journal, I don't mean I wait for God to tell me what to write. I write down any impression. I feel like I'm honoring him, even taking the time to write it down. Sometimes it's a short little phrase that I don't even know what it means. This morning, before I came here, it was not the title of the message. <laughs> it was, I'm going to increase the anointing. So naturally, I changed the title, and I taught the same stuff because it is on the anointing. The original title was, Spiritually responding to the influence of, come, no, spiritually coming under the influence of God. That's too long anyway. Spiritually coming under the influence of God. So God says, I'm going to shorten that. I'll wake him up and I'm first thing in the morning. I'll tell him, increase the anointing, Dennis. All right. So say it out loud, write it down, and do something that you're hearing. He, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear and to hear as a disciple so that I would have a word in season, he opened my ear. And probably just the last area is understanding the jurisdiction of your heart. Now, we said there was some limited jurisdiction, but there's a whole lot that's unlimited. You go for God with all you want. The only limitations I can see is in your gifts and callings. You're not all apostles. You're not all, part, you know, but other than that, Exodus 18 uh, you select people among you that fear God and place over them rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers. I can, I can see a, 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 a mild jurisdiction in there of responsibility. And who's to say you can't progress beyond that? Now, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, from the wilderness of Lebanon to the river Euphrates, shall be your territory. And then my favorite of all, and this is going to be our prayer in closing, is Jabez's prayer in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Oh, that you would indeed enlarge my territory. Oh, that you would indeed enlarge my territory. And that your hand would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. The name Jabez means one that caused pain. When his mother gave birth to him, Jabez, she named him, he causes pain. That I would not cause pain. In other words, I want to uh, uh, have my nature be the opposite of my name. I want to reveal the glory of God in that, in Jesus' name. So, Father, enlarge our territory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.